the biggest problem banks have with Kenyans is uh, distribution of their financial services. They used to have huge branches that couldn't scale to everyone in the country. But some other company called M-Pesa came up with a way to distribute financial services using an agency model. So the way M-Pesa became successful in Kenya, first of all, it was built by a company that had 80% dominance in the market. So every single person who had a mobile phone in Kenya, seven out of 10 had or was using Safaricom, was on the Safaricom network. They leveraged that network to roll out a, what's called a mobile money service. They needed a way for people to exchange their normal cash, like their paper cash, into these digital units. Yeah? So that's where their agent network really played a huge role, because this just scaled out and rolled out this agent network across the country. All of a sudden, you can send these digital units to your spouse back home. She can all come to an agent and cash out. That happens in like the span of one minute. And the great thing about this was, unlike the banking services, they'd ask you for your ID, they'd ask you for your names, they'd ask you for a birth certificate, they'd set high limits of how much you needed to have in the bank to access banking services. M-Pesa really didn't have any, any requirements. The highest requirement that you needed was an ID card, a national ID card. And then everyone in Kenya above 18 years old typically has access to a national identity card. So it meant that they lowered the threshold for accessing a financial service. The West has had a long time to build institutions, to build structures, and that's why they have a really formalized economy. Our nation is only 60 years old. It's only until recently when we've been able to put up structures. So over those years, People needed a way to make business work, you know? You can't just sit down and not do anything. Like, people needed to go out there and make some money. Uh, they have economic ambitions. What's never told, the story that's never told, is how people had also found other ways to bank themselves because the banks weren't offering these services. Now, the most popular form of banking outside the banking system were community banks. Uh, here we call them social savings groups. Social savings groups, charmers, Sometimes they're called Roscars, a rotating and savings credit associations. Sometimes they're called merry-go-rounds. So it's like a spectrum of different forms of, of community banks, sometimes of 30 people, sometimes of 40 people, sometimes of 100 people, sometimes of farmers, sometimes of people who are in business together, sometimes of uh, old people. And the most interesting one I found is when 30 people get together and they decide to pool savings together, yeah? So they have like a social contract. They've agreed these are the rules that are going to govern us. This is how much we're going to contribute. And this is our vision. This is our goal. Uh, in a typical Chama meeting, uh, let's say the one that we do, the table banking, we meet as a group of people. We come with our monthly savings. Now, this money, we put it on the table. And that's one of the things that we call it table banking because every form of banking, we, we are doing it on a table. If any one of us required some credit, you get out of this money. This money will be paid the following month with an interest. Some groups, they will ask for 5% of that amount per month. Other groups will ask for 10%. So this excess money is shared among the members as dividend. This is where uh, member uh, records, the client's record. Uh, Litten. Here we record uh, the savings and the credit, the loans for members. As you can see, there is a page for savings, yeah, savings transaction, then the loans transaction. Every time they are coming for the meeting or for the chamas, they have to come with this book so that they, whatever they, they, they contribute, whatever they pay is written in this book. What, what I really like most about these chamas, it can boost someone's life. Eh? I have seen many, many people who were doing nothing initially, but after they join the chama, they can start something. I have tried several to acquire bank loans. To my disappointment, and the, at the end of the, of the process, it failed. But the moment I joined chama, well, everything went well. I started by saving, retro by retro, 
and by the end of the third month, I was able to get a loan and I started my, my own business. I started with Chama's school some years back, back in the university. We had a small Chama where we used to contribute a little, a little bit of money every month. One of the things that we've been doing is giving credit to members. So once we, our members have for a period of six months, they qualify to get a loan. One of our members called Samuel, we financed him uh, last year. He bought a vehicle that he uses in Uber. I'm a businessman and I do transportation. I own my own vehicle. And uh, also this vehicle, I came up with this business through a charmer. I, I took a loan to buy my own vehicle. Uh, that's where, uh, that was a matter to vehicle. From there, I had to sell it and uh, buy this one. I have it right now, and now is a cab driver. So in Kenya, we, we, we sort of have, uh, we have banks at the front, we have M-Pesa, we have cooperatives, we have formal social service groups, we have informal social service groups. So you can exist outside the banking system and you're still accessing all the sort of financial services you'd access from a bank. So if it's a group of people who are traders, they could decide we're going to use this to fund one of our members who's trying to grow her business, yeah? Why is that better than going to the banks? It's because if she decided to go to a bank and ask for a loan, they're going to take her through all these processes that could take up to three months. So these people find that within their saving circles, it's much easier to get a loan because within the saving circles, it's her friends, it's her network. Yeah, it's people who know her. Banks are faceless, you know, they're, they're institutions, it's a wall, you're talking to this artificial person. Yeah, but it's very different with the community groups. With the community groups, it's not just transactional, yeah. it's also social. So there's a connection, there's, there are relations. And I think it's because of that human element that the banks can't really manufacture, that you can't manufacture a connection with another human being. In Chamas, especially in table banking, there are several challenges. And one of the major challenges is lack of uh, what we call finances to sustain the groups. Most of these groups, they are formed by people with a common interest. So when they come together and one of them is not paying, they will put peer pressure. They will put pressure on him or her so that he may be able to, to pay. Let's say is people within a market environment. Maybe they are selling eggs in the market. They will put pressure on the suppliers of the eggs not to supply you with the eggs until you commit yourself to paying their money. One thing that impresses me in Kenya is uh, the young people, the energy of the young people. Now, unfortunately, the economy, it's poorly managed. So what has happened is there's very little formal opportunities for young people to get into. In Kenya, only about 20% and low and below that is the formal economy and the rest, 80%. This 80% of the population working force is employed in the informal sector. So young people, when they leave school, they're just generally just looking for opportunities. And it's happened at a time when mobile phones are taking off, when the internet is becoming more accessible to anyone. So these young people are exploring opportunities beyond their geographical boundaries. Now, taking that further, the rise of cryptocurrencies has also created another opportunity because what it's done is it's lowered the access to a very synthetic asset, you know, to anyone who has a phone, who has WhatsApp, and who has mobile money. So that completely lowers the barrier to entry for such an opportunity. Going forward, I think m and cryptocurrencies could fit together, they're complementary, because you can exchange, you can go to an agent, exchange cash to M-Pesa, then use your M-Pesa to exchange that into cryptocurrency, then use cryptocurrency as a gateway to the world, you know, global commerce. You could use that to pay for stuff online. You could uh, get paid with it and exchange it back into Kenya shillings. So I, I feel cryptocurrencies is what is going to connect young African people to the rest of the world seamlessly. When, when it was launched, people didn't know about M-Pesa. People were wondering, how would you get money by a phone? What Michael Joseph did, he ensured that agents are everywhere. That was his marketing thing. He ensured that agents are they're everywhere. 
So it made people access M-Pesa and money easily. So they accepted M-Pesa and now M-Pesa has become part of our life. So for Bitcoin, I, I, I don't know how it will, um, it will integrate into our economy, especially in Africa. Uh, maybe if the people who are um, dealing with it would, would take the same marketing stru uh, strategy of M-Pesa, where they, would, they will try and educate people at the ground level with the simple terms. If it's taking over um, the world, we have to know it and you have to know how to use it because you can't stop change. The agent networks is, is something I had thought of deeply because it's simply a model where people basically trade money. They trade digital money for physical money. So if basically we could use the same M-Pesa model to create sort of Bitcoin agents. If we could get enough Bitcoin agents, then Bitcoin would also be just a currency like any other. I first heard about Bitcoin in 2015. I'm an auditor by profession. I was auditing one of our clients. Then he was telling me, have you heard of this cryptocurrency called Bitcoin? And I was like, no, I haven't. And so he then introduced me. I first bought Bitcoin worth 300 shillings, and I was very excited. When I got into Bitcoin space in 2016, okay, most of it's because guys are seeing like the kind of returns coming in from Bitcoin. But otherwise, in terms of uh, liquidity and flexibility, local Bitcoin is really ideal for us. So um, I think cryptocurrency can be very useful to Chamas because Chamas by definition are savings groups and cryptocurrencies not only allow you to save but to increase money if you're able to invest wisely. So if Chamas invest in cryptocurrencies, then you can find they can become huge players within the economy. And I, I suspect that this has already happened because um, I think Kenya has about a billion dollar uh, worth of holdings of uh, Bitcoin. And I suspect a lot of that those holdings are charmers. For my charmer, initially, uh, when we were doing the real estate, so we looked at the returns, then we tried to sort of diversify. Because the real estate returns in Kenya are currently going down. So we took up on the stock market. So later, we diversified again when cryptocurrency became a bit more profound in Kenya. We now diversified into cryptocurrencies. I invested and also researched about it deeply, just to truly understand, it, truly understand it, because uh, I know Warren Buffett says, "Do not invest in anything that uh, that you don't really understand." How does this fit into how we could try to empower young people in Africa? How we could try to have better cross-border money systems? Uh, how can we use this to lower the cost of remittances? We, as locals, we've we've been forced, at least in Kenya to have to confront our own problems and see how crypto fits in. Table banking is becoming uh, less popular with the youth. They want digital platforms where they can transact all these business. We are now trying to put everything on a digital platform. The first time I heard about Chama Pesa was in 2012. I was very excited to find out that Ian Grieg was part of the project. We're in Nairobi, we're uh, looking at the Chamas uh, of Kenya, which are the small social savings groups here. We're getting familiarity with the process, uh, especially for the wider team. And we're um, moving forward to, if you like, establish a bridgehead, build the team up here to start thinking about rolling out our product, which is Chama Pesa, the, uh, the application. The software is, if you like, uh, at its core, it's imported blockchain style software, but the local uh, application, the front end, the features and so forth are working closely with the concept of the Chamas. We are in a position where we're not actually changing the Chamas behavior except that instead of using the paper books we're going to be using smartphones. It's really taking uh, age-old um, finance concepts and which they have developed locally and which we have developed in, in IT and bringing them together. We can group the Chamas together into a community of Chamas. We can create an ability to uh, bring referendum in to allow them as a community to work. And we can create a global arbitration scheme, if you like, which allows them to resolve their disputes within their own community and achieve the resolution that allows them to get back to work, back to savings. And with these techniques, we can move forward to um, create enough certainty in other chamas that chamas can start to deal with each other through this framework without having to go through laborious mechanisms. 
And this, this actually gives us a very interesting future whereby you start to get chamas of chamas and you also start to get networks of chamas. So if there is, if you like, idle savings, we can move the idle savings to some place where they're better at use, they're, they're better utilized, they can grow better. If we can create that framework that allows the chamas to work together, then we've got the chance to move the economy to the next level. Chama Pest is a project that's dear to me because uh, it's a project that I believe builds on the cultures and the customs that we have here. So it's not trying to introduce a formal, uh, a new concept to people. It's trying to take the concept, it's trying to take, to marry what's happening here already with technology. So generally I love things that work from the bottom up because I feel they're much easier. They're much easier to blend in, they're much easier to sell. And we have a lesson from M-Pesa. M-Pesa actually grew from informal networks. This is a way people would use an agent and a matatu system to send money to remote areas. And when these technologies came in and they realized, wow, we can actually build a system that closely resembles this, that's why it took off. So I love Chama Pesa because it's a bottom-up kind of project. People are looking at it more as, a, as an opportunity to advance themselves economically. They're going to push it, they're going to push. It's just within their reach, they have all their tools. It's something that's taking over their world. It's something that's happening everywhere else. And if there are going to be any opportunities that are going to emerge online, best believe young, young people in East Africa are going to, they're going to tap into that.